coming with the end inside. I think we'll probably have three more sessions after tonight, which will wrap up then the first half of the Gospel of John. Sometimes it's good to rem remind ourselves what it is we've been doing for 26, uh, 25 weeks, 26 weeks together. And if you remember, when you start in the Gospel of John, we start with the baptism. The baptism takes place at the River Jordan. It's obviously going to be in a valley. Jerusalem was in the mountains. And what John has been doing, if I can use the metaphor for doing it, is we have been essentially climbing from the River Jordan, making a slow climb, ascent to Jerusalem. Welcome back. Uh, and over the last several weeks, you've kind of noticed it's gotten a little like climbing. It's gotten a little steeper, a little heavier uh, in the process. This is how John is doing it. And, and this whole part is getting us then to Jerusalem, where we arrived last week for the Palm Sunday entrance. That's where we were last week. And so we are now at the plateau here, you remember that John had started us out with the, after the baptism, he immediately, we go to the uh, confrontation in the temple scene, which happened uh, at the first of Holy Week. And then we've had this whole backstory that's led us up to it. And now we're here and we start dealing with that last week together. So, to give you some idea of what's ahead when you are leaving Oklahoma and you head west into New Mexico or northwest into Colorado, at some point you're going to see the mountains ahead of you. And you're going to drive and you're going to drive and you're going to drive and it seems like it takes forever to get to those mountains that you see first. And eventually you get into the foothills. And at some point, if you drive far enough and high enough, you'll get to the base of the mountain that is there that really it begins to get steep and you begin to do the ascent then. And it's when you are at the top of those peaks that the, the whole panorama and vista comes into view that made it all worthwhile to, to get there. In a very real sense, this climb we have been on that gets us to Jerusalem has just been training uh, for the real ascent, the real climb that will take place in part two of John, God willing, that we'll do together uh, starting in September. And that is once you're in Jerusalem, we have to make the climb and it's a much steeper climb to the upper room. or the ascent to the summit of the mountain that we have been going to, using that as our metaphor all along. And so we are here, finishing up with the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John, uh, catching our breath. But that does not mean we're not having to have some stuff to meditate on and to reflect on and to look back on. So that brings us up to date, I think. This is the kind of picture where we are. And uh, let me announce and welcome by the uh, internet and the video system. We've been contacted this week by uh, Andy uh, from London, England. And then we've been, I assume, and I hope I can pronounce the name correctly, Ain uh, from Ireland has contacted us as well. They're watching 
our videos. And so we welcome them as we welcome each of you to be here with us. So I think then we start this evening. We're ready for chapter 37. We'll beginning with John chapter 12, verse 21. We are now back to the present, as it were, in Jerusalem. Uh, we've made the climb. We're back here. Chapter 12. Uh, verse 17. Therefore, the people who were with him when he had called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign, had raised Lazarus from the dead. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. There's where we left off last week. We discussed that. With the arrival and entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, John has returned us and his mystagogic class to the beginning of his gospel. That is, to the confrontation of Jesus with the money changers at the temple, which occurs as the next event after the arrival in the synoptics following the Jerusalem entrance. Having returned us to the beginning, John now moves us forward towards the present, which then would bring us to John 12, beginning in verse 20. Now there, was cert that now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. In John, after Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, Greeks will come to Jesus. The unconscious prophecy of the Pharisees that we had in verse Chapter 12, verse 29, look, the whole world has gone after him, is prophetically fulfilled with the coming of the Greeks to see Jesus. One of the great issues between Christian Judaism and rabbinic Judaism was the mission to the Gentiles. Proselytes to Judaism had to become Jewish in order to join the Jewish faith. Come on in, there's room, just keep coming, it's okay. The males had to be circumcised, and men and women alike had to keep the customs, the practices, and dietary restrictions of Judaism. Converts to Christian Judaism did not. Their removal of requiring circumcision made it possible for adult males more easily to convert to Christianity. Now, John had hinted at the mission to the Gentiles earlier in chapter 7, verse 35. I didn't put it in our text, but I'll read it for us real quickly. Then the Jew, this is John 7, 35. Then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go into the diaspora, into the dispersion across the Roman Empire among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? So now specifically, the Greeks are coming to Jesus in chapter 12. Now he pointedly describes how the Gentile mission actually happened. 
these Greeks have come to Jerusalem for Passover. They are either proselytes or God-fearers, that's the would-be Jews that are not circumcised, who attend the services and sit at the back. Uh, the Gentile mission began as a mission to Jews in the diaspora. When Paul and Barnabas go out, they go to the synagogues uh, across the Roman Empire. They go to those large cities, large enough to have a synagogue. And it was in the synagogue of the diaspora that the gospel was originally preached. It was also originally rejected there. Uh, it was, except for the proselytes, and especially the God-fearers who were there. The Gentiles who were part of the synagogue, but had not yet uh, be fully, uh, hadn't been circumcised, hadn't fully uh, become Jewish in all of the practices. It was the Greek God-fearers who were the first Gentile converts to Christianity. The Greeks literally, and by Greeks is meant the Gentile world, came and said, we want to see Jesus. They came, they saw, they converted. The whole world went after Jesus. I, I am reminded of what's been going on in the United States since 1987, when the Campus Crusade group found the Orthodox Church and ever since then, the, the non-ethnic part of America, uh, the old stock Americans, the Greeks of America, the Gentiles of America, have been knocking on the doors of Orthodox churches all across America saying, we want to see Jesus. And we have come, we have seen, and we have converted. It's the replay of the same event. Uh, history being lived out, or if you will, there is no time with the gospel, and it's the same event being lived out in every generation, uh, on every continent in the timing of God. But there is more here in John's gospel than the foretelling of the success of the Gentile mission. Notice the contrast between the noisy crowd that went out to see Jesus on Palm Sunday and the Greeks who came quietly and asked to see Jesus after he arrived. Notice the contrast between the blind Pharisees back in chapter 9 who refused to see and these Greeks who came asking to see. Jesus, after his own baptism, invited those seeking to come and see. Those back here, where are you staying? He said, come and see. Those initial words back here are now the bookends that's happening by the time we get to Jerusalem. And now it's the non-Jews coming and saying, we want to see Jesus. Jesus says, come and see and the world is beginning to say, we want to see Jesus. The Pharisees had come and refused to see. The crowds had come and saw the signs, but failed to see. They saw water turned to wine, bread multiplied to feed thousands, and Lazarus raised from the dead. They saw a razzle-dazzle, tell-you-everything-you've-ever-done kind of preacher, teacher, healer. They saw a miracle working political savior who would feed them, heal them, and deliver them from their enemies. They came, but they failed to see. There's even more here. Several years ago, I happened to stand at a pulpit of a large Protestant church, and on the side of the pulpit facing the speaker, back here, People had the pulpit there and saw it. But on this side of the pulpit, there was a little brass plaque that had been mounted there so that only the speaker could see it as he stood there. And engraved on that plaque 
were these words from the Gospel of John from the Greeks. Sir, we would see Jesus. It was a reminder to the speaker on behalf of that congregation. They had not come to see a celebrity. They had not come to see a superstar. They had come to see Jesus. They had not come to hear a speaker talk about himself. They had not come to be entertained, nor scolded, nor lectured. They had come to see Jesus. Sadly, today the Palm Sunday shouts of the religious promoters drown out the quiet desire to see Jesus. Circus churches with a superstar Jesus in the center ring compete with MTV plus Jesus for entertainment ratings. The mega church crowds now come seeking a superstar Palm Sunday kind of Jesus. Has Jesus this time in our time been caught up in the frenzy? Has he finally succumbed to show off his power in the big cities with the bright lights? Fear not, daughter of Zion. This king who comes riding on a donkey does not listen to the voices. He does not succumb to temptation. Others still turn his arrival into a noisy grand debacle of Palm Sunday Christianity 52 weeks a year. His disciples today have become celebrities themselves, but Jesus still quietly rides into town on a donkey. The voices he listened to are the quiet voices saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. After his baptism, Jesus had been asked where he dwelt. That is, within what sphere of understanding did he live? To which question Jesus replied, Come, and you will see. When Philip said he had found the Messiah, the one Moses had spoken of, Nathanael asked whether anything good could come out of Nazareth, to which Philip replied, Come and see. From the invitation to come and see in the first chapter of John until Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, when the Greeks came asking to see Jesus, from his baptism until the Last Supper, John has given us ample opportunity to see Jesus, to see the realm of understanding within which he lived. Like the man born blind, we have had the opportunity to see Jesus, to meet him and to experience who he is for ourselves. We have also been invited to come and see where Lazarus was buried. To see the world of death all of us are living in. From the first chapter until the twelfth, Philip has brought those who would see to Jesus. John 12, 22. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Yet again, John surprises us. John has given us so many memorable scenes. The wedding at Cana, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the paralytic at the pool, the woman caught in adultery, the man born blind, raising Lazarus from the dead, and the anointing by Mary of Bethany. In this scene, the Greeks have come asking to see Jesus. Philip and Andrew have gone to inform Jesus. Instead of fleshing out the scene, John surprises us with ambiguity. John simply says, 
Jesus answered them. Does John mean them, the Greeks? Or them, the two disciples? Or them as in all of them? The ambiguity reminds us of the scene with Nicodemus in chapter 3 that is filled with the purposeful ambiguity of John's using words with double meanings, begotten, birth, wind, spirit. The ambiguous them is a signal, a sign for us to pause and look beneath the obvious. John is writing 80, 90 AD, and by 90 AD, the Greeks have come to see Jesus. Across the Roman Empire, the gospel is being proclaimed, and non-Jewish people are being baptized and following Christ. The them in 80 AD was inclusive, all of them. What Jesus has to say is for those who follow him, Jews and Gentiles alike. You see, for John, there is no time. The risen Savior is a present Savior. He is present in the present. He is not up there or out there. He is here and he is present. Almost 2,000 years after John wrote his gospel, the Savior about whom he wrote is still here, still present with those who have come to see him. What Jesus has to say is for us. Jesus is speaking to us as we read John's gospel. When John says Jesus answered them, he means us as well. We are the Greeks, the non-Jews that have come to see Jesus. We are the them that Jesus answers. Here is what he is saying to us. Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. The wedding feast at Cana in chapter 2 has Eucharistic overtones. The changing of water into wine points to the changing of the wine into the blood of Christ. Jesus tells his mother at the wedding feast, my hour has not yet come. At the end of chapter 12, with Thursday of Holy Week looming in chapter 13, Jesus declares right here in John 12, 23, the hour has come. That which had not come at Cana of Galilee has come now come in Jerusalem. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. The second half of John, the book of heavenly things, that mountain range that's beginning to loom in front of us, also known as the book of glory, leads us into a deeper understanding of the death and resurrection of Jesus. As we shall see in the book of heavenly things, John refers to the death and resurrection of Jesus as his glorification. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says to us, to those of us that have come to see him 
And Jesus tells us a little parable about a grain of wheat being planted in the ground, dying, as it were, and being reborn and bringing forth new life in a stalk of grain. This little parable has obvious overtones of death and resurrection. But is Jesus speaking about his approaching death and resurrection in 30 AD? Or is the resurrected Jesus in 80 AD, 90 AD, and now today in 2018, telling us a parable about us? A similar scene. I told you, once you get here, it gets a little heavier. Uh, this is pretty heavy stuff. This isn't quite as easy going as it was down here in the shallow land of second and third and fourth chapters of John. John 12, 23 through 26, the little parable, is similar to a scene found in all three gospels, uh, synoptics. Following Peter's confession of Christ, Jesus speaks of his death and resurrection, and all three contain a version of this passage from Mark. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? and loses his own soul. What shall he give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Mark wrote his gospel after the shock of the martyrdom of Peter and Paul in 64 AD. Mark reminds us there is a price to be paid in following Christ that could entail being put to death. He also reminds us of an implied denial of Christ because we are ashamed to let anyone know that we are a Christian, that we are ashamed of what others will think of us if they discovered we are Christians. That is an implication, but nowhere have we ever in the church taught to openly embrace martyrdom. We don't go out of our way to run down the street in the middle of a hostile anti-Christian mob going, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, kill me, kill. We don't do that. Notice the verses at the heart of this passage. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What shall he give in exchange for his soul? Now from the chronological point of view of the Synoptic Gospels, the heart of this passage is gaining this world, but losing the world to come. Sequence. John's version is not about saving something now and losing out later, or losing something now and saving something later. It's not chronological. This passage in John is about loving the dead life one has in the world of death rather than hating the life one is living in death, the one, the, the life one is living in death and desiring instead to be living in the world of life. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone in John's gospel. We are created for companionship with God. We are created to become like God, the God who is personal. 
Adam and Eve were created to become like God by becoming persons, by ecstatically stepping outside of themselves towards God and towards each other, Adam and Eve would move from the starting point of creation toward the goal of creation to be like God. We were created to become like God, to be persons relating to the Trinity who is personal and to be persons relating to one another as persons. Adam and Eve rejected the goal of becoming persons. In their rejection of God, they chose to be an individual. They chose to be a self. They each became an individual, isolated self. They were given to each other because it was not good to be alone. In their rejection of God, even though still together, they, Adam and Eve, were both now alone. If you would come after me, deny yourself. Salvation begins with the denial of the self. The denial of the self is achieved by this ecstasis, stepping outside of, oh, me, it's all about me, towards someone else and acting in their behalf without need of it having a benefit for us. Christ did not come to be served, but to serve. He came to give himself for the life of the world. God exists ecstatically as Trinity, three persons. The denial of self occurs ecstatically when we are compassionate to the least among us. We are the grain of wheat that is alone. We will remain alone and lonely as an individual self unless and until we die to the old man in the waters of baptism, until we are begotten from above, and are resurrected to living a new life in the kingdom of God, in the world of life. He who dies in baptism is no longer alone. He is resurrected from the baptismal waters into a great harvest of companions and fellow pilgrims learning how to live in the world of life learning how to be persons. So life in this world. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This world is the only world we know until we are begotten from above into the world which is to come and begin living in that world now. St. Paul said that in being begotten into the world of life, that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new meaning we are no longer living in the old world of death, but are now living in the new world of life. We are a new creation, but we bring a lot of baggage with us. We do not yet know how to walk, much less live in this new world. It is easy to try to walk the way we did in the old world, it may take us the rest of our lives to get used to living in the world of life.
but we will never get used to living in the world of life if we keep hanging on to the world of death and the things in the world of death. Jesus is not an additive to our old life. It is not our old life plus Jesus. Our old life is a life in the world of death. If we love our life in the world of death, we will lose our life when the judgment that has already been given is carried out and enacted on that world of death and those choosing to remain in the world of death. Those who hate living in the world of death and have through Jesus entered the world of life will now begin living the life that is non-ending. The world of death is the lonely world of the individualistic, selfish self. We can cling to our lonely life as an individualist, selfish self, and the life we cling to will shrivel and die. Or we can renounce our life as a selfish self and let God give us a new life that will not shrivel and die, a life of ecstatic leaving, learning how to live in behalf of and for the benefit of those around us. Each year at Pascha, a new class of catechumens come to Jesus and is baptized into the kingdom. The newly baptized live in a chronological world of time. They have heard the catechism presented to them chronologically, and chronologically speaking, there is this world and the world to come. But the danger of thinking chronologically is that we think of life in the world of life as future and not for now. Chronologically thinking in the West creates Christians who are saved now by baptism from hell when they die, or saved now by saying a sinner's prayer from going to hell when they die. But what about now? What's now for? Once you've got your get out of hell card, why bother with anything else now? It's irrevocable. I got my card. Eastern Christianity's worship is based on the eternal now. The kingdom of God is present in the divine liturgy now. Living in the world of life is available now. Eastern Orthodox Christians immigrating to the West came under the influence of Western chronological thinking and the average Americanized Orthodox Christian, much the same as those once baptized, once saved, always saved, thinkers of the West, also now understand salvation as something that is only for the future. The present is the opportunity to earn or somehow gain salvation out there in the future. But the, both the Western view and the westernized Eastern view, by using a chronological system that locates eternal life in the future, exclude the living of the Christian life now. For both groups, theosis, becoming like God, may exist in theory, but it does not exist in practice. They believe theosis is reserved for an elite, the saints or the monks or the nuns, 
To them, it is absurd to expect ordinary Christians to live in the world of life now. However, if the life which Jesus came to give us is not available to be lived now, then what is now for? Even as Philip and Andrew brought the Greeks to Jesus, so also John's gospel brings the newly baptized to Jesus. Jesus tells them and us that those who love their life in their chronological world will lose it. Jesus tells us to give up our world of time and begin living in the timeless world of eternity. We must give up living in our chronological, empirical world if we wish to see Jesus and live in the timeless world of eternal living. Wow, I know it's heavy. Serving and following. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Jesus is not a freelance Christ. He does not offer us freelance Christianity. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have a personal relationship. The Trinity is three persons, not three individuals or three selves. The life Jesus gives is the life of personhood. It is an ecstatic life created by being in relationship with the God who is personal. To serve another is an ecstatic act. It is to act in behalf of someone else for their benefit. We serve Jesus by following him. We follow with our feet, which is to say, with our lives. We follow his example of living in behalf of others. He did not see a lady caught in adultery. He saw a person. He did not judge her or criticize her. He treated her with dignity and respect. He personalized her. He gave her the opportunity to stop being a thing, an adulteress, misspelled in your notes, and set her on the path to becoming the unique and unrepeatable person she was created to be. He tells us to go and do likewise. As we take our faltering steps at personalizing others, the miracle of our own personalization begins. We become like God as we behave like the God who is personal. Well, that's a full plate. Probably a good time to go ahead and stop. Wow, 10 minutes till. But when you're full, you're full. You push back from the table. So let's go have some regular snacks after all this spiritual food. We'll come back in just a little bit. Thanks. You know, when the climb gets a little steeper, uh, the going gets a little tougher, but you don't get to go as long. And I suspect this evening we will be able to not go as long because it's a harder climb. And we may find this true next week as well. Uh, that's just the way climbing is. We come now then to a frightening verse. A frightening verse. Where I am, my servant will be. Where I am, my servant will be. One of the scariest 
if that's a word, most frightening verses in the New Testament is found in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Depart from me. What a warning. This is God's judgment on freelance Christianity. I never knew you. Depart from me. Hear the words of Jesus to us from John. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, my servant will be also, close quotes. He does not order us to serve him. He created us with free will. It is our choice once we have been baptized whether we will serve Jesus or not. But if we choose to serve Christ, if we choose to have an ecstatic life in Christ, then let us follow Christ by following his example. Let us begin learning how to do what Jesus does, to behave towards others the way Jesus behaves towards them. Let us turn the other cheek. Let us do good to those who despitefully use us. Let us bless and not curse. Let us love our enemies and those who threaten us by being different from us. Jesus is here. Let us be where Jesus is. Those who serve Jesus will be where he is. But some will hijack Jesus. On Palm Sunday, there were those who turned the arrival of Jesus into the triumphal entrance. They hijacked Jesus for their own purposes. There are also those who hijack the words of Jesus and use them for their own purpose. The parable of the sheep and the goats divides the nations into two camps based on whether they did or did not do certain things. Whether we fed the hungry, whether we gave drink to the thirsty, whether we welcomed the stranger, whether we clothed the naked, whether we visited the sick, whether we went to those in prison. Kindness in the world of death is welcomed. Good works, good deeds, Acts of kindness are important. But there is a difference between good deeds done by dead men in the world of death and good deeds done by living men in the world of life. That difference is Jesus. Good deeds done without Jesus are different from good deeds done with Jesus. Therefore, there is a warning. Depart from me, I never knew you. There's obviously a difference. At the beginning of the 20th century, Protestants associated, associated with the progressive movement sought to correct social problems and social injustice by using the government to apply their version of Christian ethics to society. They believed it was up to them to create the kingdom of God on earth by eliminating social ills. They asked the question, 
What would Jesus do? Then they filled in the blank with their own answer du jour. But their efforts, by their own efforts, they would eliminate the obstacles blocking the second coming of Christ and would help usher in the kingdom of God on earth. They replaced the gospel with the social gospel. They replaced the gospel of becoming like God with the good deeds gospel of building their own version of the kingdom of God. Churches became social agencies. Jesus became a social worker, a marcher, a protester against poverty, social injustice, racial injustice, sexual injustice, gender injustice, a protester of the cause of the month, whatever that cause might be. Churches became centers for programs to feed and clothe people, programs to help the needy, programs for unwed mothers, programs for voter registration, and programs for meeting the social needs of people. Food, drink, clothing, shelter, and medical attention only postpone death. They cannot give life. Economic prosperity and social equality provide the illusion of life by offering the luxury of being able to disguise the fact that we are living in the world of death. Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful programs we have and all the people we have helped in your name. And I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. You see, Jesus has come to give life. He has come that we might have a relationship with him. He has come that we might step out of the world of death and begin living in the world of life now. He has come that we might have the opportunity to become like God. He has come that we might begin achieving the very goal for which we were created to become personal, even as God is personal. We have become, we have been be created to become persons and in turn to personalize others and the world. The poor, unwed mothers, the woman caught in adultery, gays, lesbians, the stranger, all these are just categories. We're just helping categories. We have created programs to help categories. We give money to categories. We're not being personal. We're not behaving ecstatically towards anyone. We're not personalizing anyone, nor are we being personalized by them in return. Jesus is not interested in programs. He is interested in people. He did not come to create a society for the prevention of cruelty to people. The Lord did not come through his incarnation to do something for the people, to organize them in this temporary life. You may not find this there or to enlist them in a political or social struggle. Rather, he came to do something for mankind, to save it and raise it to its ancient dignity. I'm quoting there Archimandrite Vasilios of Iveron. He came to build his church that would be stronger than the gates of Hades. By his resurrection, he shattered the gates of death and opened paradise to the thief. He did not come to start a program. He came to conquer death. He did not come to feed us a loaf of bread. He came to feed us with the bread of life in the Holy Eucharist. God became man so that we might become like 
God, gentle, compassionate, forgiving, and giving life abundantly to those we meet one person at a time. The church is not a social agency. The church is made of people who are being personalized, people who are beginning to act like God's toward like God towards others. The church is comprised of people who by personally responding to the human being in front of them, the poor, the naked, the hungry, the lonely, the adulterer, the homosexual, the store clerk who can't make change, is treating... I'm being personal. It's a whole lot easier to talk about them than to be personal. Is treating them as Jesus would treat them and in return are being personalized and becoming like God. For my Father and I are one. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, that where I am you will be. If anyone serves me, my Father will honor them. My Father will honor them with his presence. My Father and I are one. If you have seen me, you have seen my Father. There is no division between the Father and the Son. When we say one, the other is included automatically. St. Basil put it this way, if one truly receives the Son, the Son will bring with him on either hand the presence of the Father and that of his Holy Spirit. From what, whatever end you begin in speaking of the Holy Trinity, you will end up with the co-presence and co-existence of all three persons at once. It is impossible to say that in God any of the three persons exist or can exist in separation from the other persons. The three constitute such an unbreakable unity that individualism is absolutely inconceivable in their case. God as Trinity is not a matter for academic speculation, but for personal relationship. It is truth revealed only by participation in the Father-Son relationship through the Holy Spirit that allows us to cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 15, Galatians 4, 6. To serve Jesus is to be in an ecstatic, personal relationship with Him. To be in a personal relationship with Jesus is to be where He is and to be with whom He is, the Father and the Holy Spirit. It is out of this relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we then behave towards others and treat others as persons. It is persons that we forgive and are compassionate towards. It is persons we feed and clothe and visit. It is those very persons that are personalizing us. So who are we talking about? You got a blank page there. So who are we talking about? Who exactly are we supposed to treat as persons? You see, that's a legal kind of question. There was a lawyer that once asked those kind of questions to Jesus. The lawyer asked what he had to do, not what he had to believe. What do I have to do to have eternal life? Jesus said, what does it say? The lawyer quoted him the rule, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. 
Jesus said, you got it. Go and do it. Now, the lawyer, being a good lawyer, starts crawfishing. Okay, now we're going to have some fun. Well, let's see now. I've got to go love my neighbor as myself. But if the party of the first part is supposed to do something for the party of the second part, who exactly is the party of the second part? See, I'm a lawyer. I'm not putting down lawyers, but that's legal thinking. Party of the first. If I'm supposed to love my neighbor, the party of the second part, it's a legal contract. I need to know who that is. Or I'm not guilty for not doing it. I'm off the hook. <laughs> and so Jesus tells him a story. Tells him a parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan. We've all heard it so much. It is so westernized in our thinking about creating a social program of helping somebody that it's almost impossible for us to hear that parable with fresh ears. So maybe we ought to just stop and turn aside. Go and do likewise. Luke 10, 25 is where the parable is told. Let me share with you my personal response to that parable, if you'll allow me to be personal tonight. Unlike State Farm Insurance, I am not a good neighbor. In fact, I'm not even a bad neighbor. You see, I'm not a neighbor at all. I am an individual. I am good at being an individual. I follow the golden rule. I treat others the way I want to be treated. I treat them as individuals, and I expect them to treat me the same. I am kind. I am nice. I am courteous. Individuals mind their own business and live inside themselves. I'm more interested in being pleasant. I'm friendly. I'm sociable. But I'm not a neighbor. You see, a neighbor is not an individual. A neighbor is a person. Individuals are really trapped into living in a world of individualistic isolation. But persons aren't individuals. They have learned how to step outside themselves. They have learned how to live outside themselves and have real relationships. Individuals treat others as objects, as self-contained, isolated individuals. But persons treat others as persons. That's why persons are neighbors. They don't treat others as individuals. They treat others as persons and invite others to be persons also, to be in a real relationship with them. In the summer of 2007, our Orthodox Study Fellowship read and discussed concerning frequent communion, communion of the Immaculate Mysteries of Christ by Nicodemus the Hagarite. We had made it to St. Nicodemus' comments on the Lord's Prayer. I will never forget the day we were in chapter 6 of his book, which covered forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I have underlined many passages in this book, but this page is the only page that I ever put a bookmark in. St. Nicodemus said, Our Lord shows with these words from the Lord's Prayer that he wants us to have compassion and mercy towards one another. For man does not resemble and become like God in any greater way than by showing compassion. When we read this passage, these words in class that day, these words seem to leap off the page and burn with life. 
I wrote this note in the margin of my book. Theosis equals the compassion of God becoming our behavior as well. Our class was over at noon, and these words were alive within me as I drove to lunch. I went inside a fast food restaurant, and it was packed. You had several cash registers, several lines. It soon became obvious that I had chosen the wrong line. <laughs> the other lines are moving, and mine isn't. At best, the clerk was incompetent. At worst, I wondered how she got the job in the first place. I do not suffer fools gladly, and I suffer them not at all if I can help it. I'm an individual. <laughs> Go in front of the church and confess your sins. I was boiling on the inside. I was fuming. I had my arms crossed. <sighs> Rolling my eyes over. After taking forever, Finally, it was my turn to order. As she asked for my order, she spoke with a speech impediment. It was then that I noticed she had hearing aids in both ears. She was hearing impaired. Like Peter remembering the words of Jesus when the cock crowed, I remembered the words of St. Nicodemus. Man does not become like God in any greater way than by showing compassion. I have never been as ashamed of myself as I was at that moment. God is Trinity. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are persons. They are not individuals. The Holy Trinity is three persons in relationship with each other. God does not exist in individualistic isolation. God exists in Trinitarian relationship. And God created us in his image and created us with the possibility of achieving his likeness. To become like him. To become like the image of God we carry within us. He created us to be persons in relationship with him and with each other. But in the fall of Adam and Eve, we stopped being persons and became individuals. In the fall, we stopped living in real relationships and began living in individualistic isolation. But thanks be to God, through our baptism and chrismation, we have been begotten from above. We have become the children of God. We are now persons learning how to be in relationship with God and learning how to be in real relationship with each other. I am not yet a neighbor. I am just now learning how to step out of myself and be a person. I am just now learning to say no to being an isolated individual and instead saying yes to being a person in real relationship with others. I wrote these words five years ago. I actually gave them as a homily to the church five years from that day that I had had my encounter with both St. Nicodemus and the clerk. That makes me a five-year-old person. I'm still in kindergarten. Every morning when I go through the drive through and order breakfast, I now at least call the clerk by her first name. When I stop for gas on my way home at night, I at least know the names of the clerks but I'm a very long way from the compassion of God being reflected in my behavior. St. Paul told us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I really have to work at being a person instead of an individual. 
Being a person does not come easy for me. Being a neighbor does not come easy for me. Now, as an individual, it's easy to be nice and kind when I want to. But I really have to work at letting God's mercy and compassion be at work in me, especially when dealing with those who so easily irritate me. Which of these in today's gospel was a neighbor? We all know the answer. The one who acted like God. Go and do likewise. Well, God bless you for coming and being here tonight. I think we have probably three more sessions to go. And we will complete the first 12 chapters and cross the finish line. So God bless you and thank you for being here.